A few announcements before we get started. <clears throat> On our prayer list, uh, Kaylee Richie's grandmother passed away last week, and we want to keep that family in our prayers. We want to remember to pray for Anita Mayfield. She's having issues with cancer. She's a friend of Ann's sister-in-law. We want to remember Brother Paul Lemon. Uh, we want to remember Chenny and Danny Carpenter. They're both dealing with health issues. Uh, remember to pray for Gina. Damon Miller was at Ohio State University with chest pain, and Damon was treated and released. This is Ashley Carter's father. Roberta Piggott, is, her birthday is February 16th, and she's going to be 83. Uh, we'd like to have a card shower and an enhanced event for Roberta. Her address is on the PowerPoint. You can get it uh, back on the bulletin board. We have her address posted back there. Is there anything else that needs to be announced about the sick or prayer request? Yes. Uh, my mother, my stepmother-in-law, her grandson, I think he's maybe 20, 21 years old, somewhere around that age, he suddenly passed away a couple of days ago. So that family's... What, what was his name? Uh, I've only ever met the kid a couple times. I can't remember his name. Okay. His last name is Harris, I think. Anything else? Pam one, my step step mother in law. That was her son? Grandson. Grandson. <laughs> Anything else needs to be announced about the sick or any prayer request? A list of upcoming events. We have several birthdays and anniversaries. And Ed and Margaret O'Dell want to thank everyone for all the cards and expressions of love and well wishes on their anniversary. And I told Margaret she earned their love. I also have a thank you card from Larry and Vaughn Shears to the Sunrise Church. Thank you for the food, love, flowers, and cards. And this is from Larry and Bonnie Shears and the family of Mama Jean Williams and the Eagle family. Upcoming events. Uh, Monday night merge, the schedule is listed there in the bulletin. The North End next weekend, or next week. And we're gonna have the drive through baby shower for Leander and Mark Parsons next Saturday. At 2 p.m., she's registered at babylist.com. Uh, the Monday Night Merge is listed there at Ladies Digging Deep on Thursday, February 23rd, and CYC and Pigeon Forge the 26th to the 28th. It's also going to be online. Is there any other announcements that need to be made before we begin? This morning, the title of the lesson will be The Will of the Father, and Elvis will be Speaking on that shortly. Brother Mike's going to see you singing. Turn it over to Brother Mike. Page 350. 350. I'm satisfied with just the God of beloved. Oh, 
study Matthew 7, 21-23 this morning. We'll go right along with that. Verse 21 says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Please bow with me in prayer. Our Father in heaven, we're so grateful for this day of life that you've given us for the opportunity that we have to gather together with those of like precious faith to worship you, to remember that sacrifice that was made on Calvary's cross on our behalf. Father, we thank you for your son Jesus and for the example that he left for us for the sacrifice that was made on Calvary's cross. Father, we pray that you will be with each of us, help us to reach out to those around us, to show them your, your glory and power. We pray, Father, that you will continue to bless the congregation here at Sunrise and, and help us to, to grow in spirit and in knowledge. Father, we pray that you would be with those of our numbers that are shut in and unable to get out due to the pandemic or, or other health reasons. And we pray, Father, that you will give them strength and courage in their time of trouble. We pray, Father, that you will help each of us to reach out and encourage them as Christian brothers. Father, we pray that you would be with the leaders of this nation. 
and nations around the world. Guide them in the decisions that they make. Father, we pray that soon Christians everywhere might be able to worship you without fear. Father, we ask that you would forgive us for we've sinned against you. Help us, Father, and give us strength to resist the temptations that Satan places before us. We pray, Father, that when our lives here are ended, we might have that happen and return home with you in heaven. So in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Page 383. 383. Off we come to get.
Thank you. Thank you. Through the line. Paul, thank you for this uh, fruit of the vines uh, that we'll take out of here. It represents the blood of Christ, the blood that flows so freely there on the cross, and it washes away our sins, and makes us white as snow. Thank you, Father, for uh, Christ and His willingness to do the thing that He did, so that we would have this opportunity. And it's through His name. Also says uh, on the first day of the week, uh, uh, lay their waste in stores. Uh, some is the work of the church, so that uh, we'll have it. And, and if it says we live, that way there won't be any collection from any jumps. So if you want to make any contribution, just take some of the facets on the back page. <coughs> Page number two. Sing the first three verses of this. Page number two. Oh, wonderful Savior is Jesus my Lord. Oh, wonderful Savior to me. He hides my soul in the cleft the rock where rivers of pleasure I see. He hides
Good morning. It's good to see everyone this morning. Certainly glad you are with us this morning. When we think about people, I don't know what the percentages are, but there's a large percentage of people that believe in God. And there's a large percentage of people that don't believe in God. And when we look at mornings like today where we wake up and we go out and there's it's white, God has made a beautiful day, a beautiful morning, and and, and, and you ever wonder why snow was white? God could have made it any color. But white is generally when it falls, it's generally pretty not nice to drive on sometimes, but pretty beautiful, isn't it? But what about those people that do believe in God but don't really follow the right path? path. And that's where we're kind of going this morning. Sometimes it's hard to discern maybe even the footsteps of Jesus or the will of God and exactly which way to go. When we look at these verses in 7 through 23, we see Jesus is continued by contrasting two different kinds of followers, those who obey and those who do not obey. His words likely continue the, the, the theme of false prophets or false teachers who suffered from self-deception. In other words, we were talking last week about false teachers and self-deception, and, and people think, well, I think I'm on the right path. I think I'm going to heaven. But when we look down, down at the scripture, they were mistaken because they weren't followers of the word of God. And they, they kind of in their mind said, well, I, I want to be followers of, of God, but yet I, I kind of don't know what to do. Or, or maybe I do my own thing, or, or I haven't looked at the scripture, or I haven't interpreted the scripture correctly. And, and, and so not only did they deceive those that they were teaching, those false teachers, but they also, in the end, deceived themselves. And Jesus acknowledged that even false prophets sometimes would speak the truth. And when, when they address him, Jesus as Lord, Lord, it, it shows that they recognize his authority and his divinity. See, here's where we're coming to the problem 2020, 2021, 2022, and on. There's hundreds, like I said last week, of what we call religious bodies in any particular area. Some places may be more than that. Well, we can't all be right, can we? If someone just says, Lord, Lord, does that mean they're right with God? Well, Jesus began this argument years and years ago, and, and he would say this, he would notice that, that they're 
that their confession, there we go, their confession corresponds to the confession of the early church that Jesus is Lord. So, so it's, it's kind of a, a beginning step, isn't it? You ever see a little baby begin to walk? And, and we get so excited when this happens. At least the mothers do anyway. The guys, the fathers aren't as excited. But, but you know, the parents are, are usually very excited when the baby was crawling. Oh, the baby's crawling. Oh, that's cute. That's beautiful. And, and pretty soon they, they, they stand in the little cells up. And, and, and pretty soon they take one step. What happens? They fall down. But we're excited for the step, aren't we? Well, we are, and we say, well, that's great. We just got to get you to take some more steps. Get up there. Try again. Try again. You know, we try to get them up and try again. And they do over time. And, and, and so when we talk about belief and confession, we're, we're kind of at that first step. We're not there yet, though. We're, we're at the first step because the first acknowledgement is that Jesus is Lord. If I can't get over this, this, this pump, so to speak, and, and then I'm going to have problems. So I have to first acknowledge that Jesus is Lord. See, the, the Jews really had difficulty with this. That they were waiting for the Messiah. They, they, they weren't quite sure of what his name would be or, or anything else. They just knew that there would be a Savior. There would be a Messiah. There were promises. If you look at the last book of the New or the Old Testament, the book of Malachi, it, it speaks about the coming of this Messiah. And so they're waiting and waiting. And, and, and in 2021, they're still waiting, many of them. Because Jesus came and many of them said, well, I, I, I'm not willing to make this statement that this guy here is Lord. Even though he's preaching and he's teaching, he's performing miracles, and, and then he goes to the cross and he died. And, and, and so at that point, you know, he rose again. And, and, and at that point, some were able to make the statement, but not all. And to this day, some are able to make the statement, but I'm home. And to us, mainly Gentiles, or almost all Gentiles, you know, do we want to make that statement that Jesus is Lord? Now, notice the passage here. Talk, Paul begins talking about the Jews that, that, that won't make the, that first step. They won't make that baby step. And he says in Romans chapter 10, verse 9, because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and you believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. Now, I want you to think about this for a second. If you get that baby up and they make that first step, they kind of have a hunger for it, don't they? They're not going to say, oh, that was it. I'm, I'm done walking. I'm never going to walk again. No, that baby says, oh, that was, that was a little interesting. They, they got excited and it seemed okay. Well, try it again. You know, they try it again, and they fall down. Maybe they try it again. Finally, sooner or later, they're chasing them all over the house. Oh, 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 those drawing days. You see, it gives you a desire. If I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, it, it creates in me a desire to understand that. And that's what Paul is saying. If, if these Jews, and he begin back in chapter 9 with this, if they only understood that Jesus, if they're only willing to make that confession, it, it's going to begin what they, what they do to be saved. In Philippians, he says this, chapter 2, verses 9 through 11, Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed him on the name of Jesus, that, that the name is above every name, so that the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven on earth, and under the earth, every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God. So we see a, a kind of a before in Romans that, yes, this is what you should do. And then near, in the Paul's life in Philippians, we see this is what everybody will do, whether they what? Like it or not. So whether you're, you know, someone is believes in God or doesn't, or believes correctly, or does it? We're included in this passage. In Luke 6 and verse 46, Jesus asked, Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? Why do, why do you do that? The confession of Lord, Lord by itself is, is really insufficient. Even though self-deceived miracle workers may cry out to Jesus with these words, 
that they will not enter the kingdom of heaven. Jesus said that only those who do the will of the Father may enter. Now, those who want to be saved must fulfill the defined conditions. They have the responsibility to know God's will and to obey. So we really have to look at what the will of the Father is. It's for us to take those steps. First John 5 and verse 3 says, For this is love, for the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. They're, they're not hard. They're not grievous. This word burdens in their original language means it, it, it's grievous. It's not heavy. In other words, you put that backpack on and it's heavy. It, it's his commandments are not like that. And I missed one scripture, that one. Oh, no, I really missed it. First John 5 and 3, for this is lo the love of God that we keep his commandments as commandments are, 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 oh, there it goes. John 14, 15, if you love me, you will what? Keep my commandments. And, and so we see here in, in Matthew 7 and 22, on that day. So we look at verse 21, says, you know, there's some that, that are going to say, Lord, Lord. And then he says, on that day, many will say to me, I want you to notice some language here. Many. What does that mean? That seems to mean, and Jesus is making this statement here, it seems to mean there are a lot, many, of people that believe they're on the right path to heaven, but seemingly, according to Jesus, are not. Would you say that's a fair assumption? Many will say to me, who we're going to say this to, Jesus, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name, cast out demons in your name, and do many mighty works in your name? Now, the scene Jesus depicted here is, is the false prophets, the disobedient or disobedient disciples, were given an account on the day of judgment. So it's this day that we stand before God and we stand before Jesus and, and we give account. Now, now we you know, we all kind of picture that mind, that scene in our mind, if we were standing for God, we're standing for Jesus, we're waiting to get into heaven, and, and, and we hear this. We don't want to hear that. See, the false, false, false prophet's ability to, to prophesy and cast out demons and perform miracles was neither confirmed nor denied by Jesus. However, the words, did we not anticipate an affirmative answer? At least they thought that they had done so. I have a friend that grew up in the distant friend. I, I knew him from a different youth group. And he grew up in the Church of Christ. And I, I thought this young man was pretty good in the scripture. His parents went to church and, and his dad was a deacon and, and, and they seemed to be a family. And I had gone over their house several times for Bible studies and they seemed to, to be on the right track and, and deep in the scripture and, and, and things like that. And, and actually I arranged for him to date a young lady that I knew from a different youth group and they did. And they were married and their husband and wife to this day and, and they have children. And it seems like the family is doing well. But somewhere, somehow, they got on the wrong path. And it's kind of scary when that happens. And the reason I bring this up is because this young man now believes that he has the power to heal you. You got something wrong with you this morning? He, he thinks that he has the power to heal it. Whatever that, that ailment might be with, with you, and, and, and we all have little ailments here and there, and, and, and but he believe, and I'm not really sure where he gets this from, other than deception. But he believes that he has that power. And he's believed for about five years or so that, that he has had that power. Like I say here, at least they thought they had it. Possible that they actually perform these miracles, the ones that Jesus is talking about, invoking the name of Jesus. Mark chapter 3 and in verse, Mark chapter 9, excuse me, verse 38, 39, the apostle John complained to Jesus about a man who was casting out demons in his name, but he wasn't a disciple. 
Acts chapter 3 and 6 is the same in Acts chapter 9, verse 34. The apostles spoke of, uh, of the name of Jesus over those who they successfully healed. On one occasion, some Jewish exorcists invoked the name of Jesus for their own advantage, but the plan backfired and the man attacked them, leaving them naked and wounded. Notice Acts chapter 19 and and verses 13 through 19, then some of the internet Jewish exorcists, these are, exorcists, these are these Jewish exorcists that traveled from town to town, um, undertook to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits, saying, I adjure you by the name of Jesus, whom Paul proclaims. Now, now if you have to do it like that, well, the name of Jesus, who this guy over here, uh, 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 he's good with Jesus. I, I'm not, uh, you know, it's kind of like saying, I'm not good with him, but I, I'm kind of using his power to, to do this. And the seven sons of a Jewish high priest named Sceva were doing this. And, but the, de the evil spirit answered them and said, Jesus, I know, Paul, I recognize, but who are you? It's kind of the question that that we see here in the next verse in just a moment that Jesus will say to us, who are you? The man who was the evil spirit that leaped on them, mastered all of them and overpowered them so that they fled out of the house. And they were naked and wounded. Verse 23, and then I will declare. Here's the declaration. I never, and this is a hard word, Never knew you. It's an interesting word, isn't it? Never. Never. <laughs> no, not that I, I, I knew you, then you went away. In other words, he's saying that these particular people have never, ever been on the right path. Never. In other words, they have never heard the word of God, believed in Jesus, repented of their sins, confessed Jesus, and been baptized for the remission of their sins. I've never, in other words, Jesus is saying, you've never done that. Now he's not saying that they've never said they were Christians, because people claim that word Christian all the time and have never done the steps that is outlined, the steps that are outlined by the apostles. And we'll look at some of those as our example in just a moment. He said, I've never <laughs> knew you. And if Jesus doesn't know us, if Jesus never knew us, he hears these harsh words, depart from me. And if Jesus asks us to depart, we fall into one category, one category alone, a, a sinner. And have that sin still with us, and that sin has never been washed away by the blood of the Lamb in, in baptism. Depart from me, you workers of iniquity or lawlessness, depending on what version you're reading. So this is a legal pronouncement, like a judge. Depart from me. I, I never knew. They were not his true followers. Jesus finally said to them, I, I never knew you. And the same sentiment is expressed in his parable regarding the five foolish virgins. We see part of that in Matthew chapter 25, verse 12. We also see it in Luke 13, verse 25. Once the master of the house had raised risen and shut the door. Begin to stand outside and, and, and knock at the door saying, Lord, open to us. And I'll answer you, I, I don't know where you come from. This sounds awful familiar to Genesis, doesn't it? When God provided the flood, Noah spent some hundred years building the ark and preaching there, and at that same time, a, a sermon of repentance and, and death here, it seemed like. Peter talks about this in 1 Peter chapter 3, and, 
And because of the spirits that are now in prison. It's that anguish and agony. God shut the door on the ark. Not know of God. And those who were outside were out there for eternal destruction. So what did Jesus mean by the expression, I declare, I, I never knew you? We see in Matthew 26, verse 69 through 74, a, a similar type of thing. This is where Jesus was going to the cross, and, and, and Peter was there, and we remember Peter, and, and Jesus had just been arrested, and, and now Peter was sitting outside in the courtyard. A servant girl came up to Peter and had said to him, you're with the Jesus, the Galilean. Simple question. He says, uh, he denied it before all of them said, I, I don't know what you mean. And again, he went out to the entrance while the servant girl saw him and she said to the bystanders, this, this, this man was with Jesus of Nazareth. And again, he denied it with the oath, I don't know the man. After a little while, the bystanders came up to him and said, Peter, certainly you are one of them. For your accent or your speech betrays you. Then he began to invoke a curse on himself and to swear, I don't know the man. Immediately, the rooster crowed three times. We remember that story, don't we? Where Peter denied Jesus, saying, I don't know the man. 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 19, but God's firm foundation stands bearing the seal. The Lord knows those who are his. That everyone who names the name of the Lord depart from the Nicolaitan. The words depart from me, who practice lawlessness, they, they mirror Psalms chapter 6 and verse 9. Now, the difference is the words from the psalmist are, are those of a righteous sufferer spoken to his prosecutors rather than those of a judge spoken to evildoers, as the present context. Depart from me indicates that the punishment which the disobedient will be experiencing is that being cast from the presence of the Lord. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 9, they will suffer the punishment of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his might. When it comes on that day to be glorified in his saints and to be marveled at among all who have believed because of our testimony to you was believed. So so, so we see this eternal punishment when, when Jesus doesn't know us. In Revelation chapter 21, verse 7 and 8, the one who conquers will have his heritage and I will be his God and they will be my son. Do you see this relationship in verse 7 that's wonderful? The one who conquers, the one who obeys, the one who follows my will. There's going to be this relationship between God and us. And But those who are what? Cowardly, faithless, detestable, murderers. And it's interesting how they all get shoved into one category and say, well, murder, I mean, murders are bad, yeah. But then the, the cowardly and, and detestable, and you know, all these are the one, even idolaters are there, aren't they? Liars. You say, well, murder is much, much less or much more of a sin than a lie. Have their portion of being a lake which burns with fire and sulfur, which is the, the second death. Revelation 22 and verse 14 says, Blessed are those who wash their robes so they may have the right to the tree of life, that it may enter the city by the gates. We see this wonderful, once again, this wonderful welcoming in verse 14. That this, this great excitement of the welcoming in verse 15. The, the opposite outside. The dogs and social, sexual, immoral, murderers, idolaters, and everyone who loves and practices falsehood. So despite their claim to be followers of Christ, these pseudo servants continue to practice lawlessness. In the Greek language, the word practice is a present participle, which indicates a continual action. And all they claim to perform numerous good works, they were living disobedient lives. I want to look at a couple of examples this morning. So if you have your Bibles, turn it to Acts chapter 16. Acts chapter 16. 
Acts chapter 16 is probably a familiar passage to us, and I'll actually begin at verse 13. I experienced this 14, but I'll begin at verse 13. Acts chapter 16, verse 13. On the Sabbath day, we went outside the gate to the riverside. Picture that, can't you? Sabbath day was Saturday. They went outside to the riverside area there. There, at the riverside, would be a place of prayer. Seemed to be where they had gathered for prayer. We sat down and began speaking to the woman who had a symbol. Well, it's interesting, it doesn't say there's a group of women or a group of women and men, it's just the woman who had a symbol. So Paul, Silas, those traveling with Paul. Verse 14. A woman named Lydia from the city of Thyatira. She's a seller of purple fabric, a worshiper, worshiper of God, was listening, and the Lord opened her heart to respond to the things spoken by Paul. Now, there are several things here. She's, she's a woman of means. She's a seller of purple. That's, you know, the, the high-class clothing of that line of that day. So she has, you know, a, a wealth, but yet... I want you to notice a sentence here. A worshiper of who? God. Now, was she in a right relationship with God? No. Did she believe in God? Yeah. She's assembled to the river to pray to God. She's a worshiper of God. Paul and Silas come upon her see her there. And I want you to notice what the next sentence is. They were listening to her and the Lord opened her heart to respond to the things spoken by Paul. Now we're, we're not told exactly what Paul said, but we can summarize in the next few verses what Paul said. I think Paul gave her basically the plan of salvation in not so many words. Because that's what she begins to do. Notice verse 15. And when they, when she and her household had been what? Was that a week? And when she and her household were what? Baptized. So we can kind of sum up what the conversation was. God, she, she was a believer in God, not right with God, but her ears were what? Open. That's part of the problem sometimes that, that, that we maybe we fall into our parents' religion. Maybe it's somebody we know. Maybe it's something else. And we don't dig into the word of God and understand what the real word of God says. And we're kind of, our ears are closed. For people to understand the word of God, this is kind of the dividing line. We have to have our ears open. Her ears were open. When she heard this, she believed, and her and her household, or excuse me, and when she, she heard, excuse me, her household had been baptized. So that responds to an immediate baptism. Well, where are they at? They're by the river. We don't need to go far, do we? Now she goes into service here. She says this, if you have judged me, be faithful to the Lord. Ah, well, we don't want to be judged, do we? Nobody wants to be judged. But Paul obviously explained to her the plan of salvation. She obeyed the plan of salvation. Then she checked, Paul, am I faithful at this point? If you've judged me to be faithful, come into my house and stay. And she prevailed upon that. So they did. They stayed. Obviously, they judged her to be faithful at that point. Now, I sort of follow this idea of that happened. They're going to a place of prayer, blah, blah, blah. Found a slave girl, verse 16, spirit of divination. What happens next is Paul and Silas are arrested for casting out the spirit in this girl with a, a devil in her, with an evil spirit in her. So I kind of want to. Look at ahead to verse 30. I know it says 31 on the screen, but look ahead to verse 30. 
A little, a little, a little farther up. I'm sorry. Verse 25. Verse 25. About midnight, verse 25 of chapter 16, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns of praise to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. So now they're arrested, they're in jail for casting out an evil spirit of this girl. But what are they doing? And I want you to notice this attitude of a Christian here, that they're not complaining and grumbling and saying, oh, I can't believe I'm in jail, now what am I going to do? How am I going to get bail? How am I going to get out of here? What's going to happen next? You know, I don't know. They're singing and praying. Now, when we have that attitude of a Christian where we sing and pray and are happy, what happens? People hear. Those other prisoners don't really know everything that's going on. All they know is they hear, you know, singing, praising God in the next cell. They're like, wow, what's that? Well, we don't hear that every night. That, that's something. Verse 26, and suddenly there came a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prison house were shaken. Immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's chains were unfastened. And when the jailer woke up and saw that the prison doors were open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself, supposing that the prisoners had escaped. But Paul cried out with a loud voice, saying, do not harm yourself, for we're all here. Now when's the last time that you seen or heard or looked at TV and and know that prison doors were open and the prisoners didn't leave. I know that Mark used to work at a prison and I think if the doors were open, what would they do, Mark? They well, leave. basically, most of them wouldn't go anywhere, but some of them would. Some of them would. And, and so you see the doors open, you know, and the, the, the guard is all upset. He's about to kill Paul. He says, don't, 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 don't do anything. Don't harm yourself. And he called for the lights and they rushed in and, and trembling, trembling fear and fell down before Paul and Silas and he brought them out and said sirs what what must I do to be saved and there's our question when we look for the will of the father here's our question not what someone else says not what you know some preacher says or something what God says what the Bible says what the apostles say what must I do to be saved and he says believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. I want you to notice something. Two, two accounts that we just looked at. When the leader of the household believed, their faith and their belief was so strong that what? Everybody in the household seemed to believe, didn't they? It wasn't just them and say, well, I made my own decision here. It, it was their, their faith and belief just had to be so strong that, that it overtook the household. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Remember, that's that, that step. They took that first step. But what happens next? And, and they spoke the word of the Lord to, to him together, and all those were in his house. So what, what they, what's that mean? That means they had a, a, a basically what we would call today an old-fashioned Bible study. They had a Bible study. Now, did they, did they have the Bible? They had the Old Testament. Or did they go? Oh, I bet they went to Isaiah 53 or, or some passages like that that talked about Jesus. And they took them that very hour of the night and washed their wounds immediately. He was baptized. And who else? All of his household. And they brought them into the house and they flew before them, rejoiced greatly, having believed in God with his whole household. What a what a beautiful occasion that must have been. It was evening. But it wasn't too late to go to the water and be baptized. It wasn't too late to believe in Jesus. I want you to notice something here. They could have said, well, Paul, Silas, man, <laughs> You guys are right. Next week we're going to do this. You're right. Next week we're going to go up there and we're going to get baptized. It was an urgency, wasn't there? Down in Florida, I worked many years at Bible camp down there. Did a whole lot of Bible studies. And I slept with the radio in my head. 
little two-way radio, kind of like a walkie-talkie thing. All night long. I slept in front of the door so the guys wouldn't escape. But I had a radio in my head. Because quite often I would get the call at three or four in the morning. Help us, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Maybe it might take a couple times to wake me up, but yeah, I'm here. So and so wants to be baptized. Let's go. I'll be there in five minutes. It took me long enough to walk across campus. You see, that was what happened. When we believe in God and we confess that, that Jesus Christ is Lord, it, 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 it's, we're, we're, we're taking that first step. And, and we don't want to go down and, and never take a step. We pop right up and, and take those additional steps and, and, and do them right then. And I want to close with this verse. And, and this is our, our application for today. It's do not merely listen to the word. Chant 1 and verse 22. And so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Now this is a weird version. And in the normal version is be doers of the word, not hearers only. No, don't just listen to it. But respond and do what it says. Doesn't do us any good just to listen if we don't know. This morning, as is all the time, whether it's three in the morning or some other time, Jesus provides us with the invitation to be obedient to his word. If you need to respond, we encourage you to come to trial as we stand and have Why keep Jesus waiting? Have 
recently lost family members that you would comfort them and uh, give their families uh, comfort and peace. Uh, we pray, Father, that you would guide us each in the decisions we make as we go through this day today. Also, watch over us each and keep us safe and for harm's way. And we pray all these things through your Son, Jesus' holy name. Amen.